I'm Christina Davis, Director of the Program on US-Japan Relations. I'm very happy to welcome you today to hear from Professor Motoshige Ito, who will discuss Japan's growth strategy in the 2020s, demand and supply side dimensions. Our seminar tonight is of course morning in Tokyo, where Professor Ito and some of our participants are joining us. And so while I'm saying good evening, I will also say good morning to those of us joining. Our seminar is co-sponsored by the most of our Ramani Center for Business and Government of the Harvard Kennedy School. And we are very excited to have this opportunity to think about the future of Japan's economy and reflect back on some of the challenges it has faced with us to guide the discussion is the leading expert on Japanese economic policy. Professor Ito has an incredible range of experience in academic and policy work. He is currently the professor at the Faculty of International Social Sciences, Gakshuin University. He has served over 20 years as professor at the University of Tokyo, including several years serving as dean. On the policy side, he has been president of the National Institute for Research Advancement and served on the Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy from 2013 to 2019. And he has written many, many books. I will just highlight a few. Keizai Omiru Mitsunome, Three Perspectives on Japanese Economy, which came out in 2014. And he's written several critical textbooks on macroeconomics, disequilibrium trade theories, and he's written books for the World Bank on small and medium enterprise support policy in Japan. So clearly we have one of the leading experts to help us to understand the state of the Japanese economy. Now I'd like to just go over our next seminar and our Zoom etiquette. Next week, we will be meeting slightly earlier than normal, 1130, to discuss public health and wellness. Japan in a global context, where we will have some very diverse perspectives with Karen Thornber, Amy Borovoy, Andrew Gordon joining us to look at different perspectives on what is public health and wellness. And then I'd also like to remind you for today's seminar that we would like you to keep your microphone muted and you can write a question in the chat. We'll have time for question and answer period after the presentation. And please do not record um, the images on the screen to respect privacy. Thank you very much. And now um, I'd like to turn over to Professor Ito. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you, Christina, for the very kind introduction. <coughs> it's my great pleasure uh, to be here. And good morning and good evening. So let me just uh, use uh, my presentation to just give you about 30 minutes uh, presentation. I think uh, you are now uh, watching the uh, data on Japan GDP gross domestic product uh, from 1919 to 2019. And this may provide you a very uh, good uh, uh, view about what happened in the last 20 years in Japan. One of the very important things which I want to emphasize is please look at our GDP in 1997 which was the, uh, the previous peak of our GDP uh, until it just reached a uh, recover to the original position, uh, position in the year of 2016 to or 2017. Okay, let me just uh, uh, re <laughs> repeat again. Now, this is the, I hope now you can see the trend of Japan's GDP and just be provided be a very quick review of what happened in Japan in the last 20 years, which is almost also my basic point of the, what I'm going to speak. Now, one very important uh, fact is just, uh, we had a peak of GDP in 1997, just one year before we experienced the financial crisis. And it took almost 20 years until the year of 2016 or 2017, until Japan just uh, recovered the GDP. So it's a very long period of the uh, so-called deflation or recession of the economy. You can also find there was a very uh, uh, good recovery until 2008. Uh, so we had a chance to recover, recover, but unfortunately 
because of the uh, global financial crisis coming from the Lehman crisis in 2008. And uh, they also, we had a uh, uh, big earthquake in 2011, uh, where we had also drop of GDP. So it is only when uh, Prime Minister Abe became Prime Minister uh, in the end of 2012, uh, when our GDP is uh, start growing. So the Abenomics, uh, of which I'm going to speak a little bit later, uh, was very effective uh, to change the pattern of the GDP uh, from declining to just expanding. And there was very uh, the uh, steady uh, expansion of G nominal GDP from 2013 uh, until 2019, just before COVID-19 just hit the world economy. Now, let me just uh, uh, summarize what I talked uh, by using GDP. So uh, in this period, the, there are very uh, uh, typical feature of the low interest rate and low growth rate and low inflation rate. And this kind of uh, the trend was what people often call Japanization. But unfortunately, after the Lima crisis, uh, European country uh, is uh, experiencing a very similar thing. And after COVID-19, even United States is experiencing low interest rate, low growth rate, and low inflation rate. So maybe this phenomenon is not very Japan specific, although Japan is very extreme case. And there's very, uh, the, 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 there are a lot of discussion about so-called the secular stagnation where the real long-term interest rate of major country has a trend of declining constantly in the last 30 years. And I already mentioned Abenomics, uh, the macroeconomic policy by the uh, Mr. Abe's cabinet was very effective to prove nominal GDP. But I, uh, I have to emphasize, unfortunately, real growth rate has been still very low. So in spite of the fact just uh, nominal uh, price like GDP deflators uh, start rising and which contributing to the increase in GDP and also other economic uh, indicators such as the corporate profit, uh, stock prices, unemployment rate and so on. However, uh, real growth rate has been very slow. So this is the another very important feature of the Japanese economy. And this just to explain just the basic point of the reason why growth rate of Japan was very slow. This just shows uh, the supply side of the economy, uh, the potential growth rate of Japan. The black uh, line uh, give you the trend of the potential growth rate of Japan. And you can just uh, see in these years until uh, the up to the uh, 2019, uh, before COVID-19, uh, the potential growth rate of Japan uh, is reaching almost 0%. And of course, after COVID-19, the situation is becoming much worse. So uh, from supply side, uh, the, there some, there, it, it seems to be that the Japan has difficulty of growing. And this is very important because the, as I have mentioned uh, before, the abenomics means a very strong demand uh, side stimulation in order to stop deflation. And that was effective. But unless you have a, uh, you, unless you have a su strong supply side, just the demand stimulation is not uh, sufficient to just have a recovery of the economy. Now, the potential growth rate, as you probably know, uh, can be decomposed uh, into several factors. One is labor, and second is capital, and the third uh, is the productivity uh, element. Now, in the case of labor, uh, of course, Japan is aging society, so the labor supply is not expanding very rapidly. And also during the process of the uh, reform, of working habit, you can just uh, observe hours worked, just the uh, blue one is actually declining. So Japanese people uh, work, is working uh, less hours in, in these days. And in the case of the uh, number of employed, uh, in spite of the fact that our population is aging, there was uh, just a slight increase in number of employed, which is actually indicated by gray area 
uh, after, especially after Mr. Abe started the uh, Abenomics in 2013, there was a very, uh, the constant, also it's a very uh, small amount uh, increase in labor. Uh, and this is very much related to the increasing participation of female workers in labor market. And for capital, uh, which is indicated uh, by yellow uh, part, uh, again, it is increasing gradually from 2013. So we do have a, a expansion of capital stock uh, after economics. But again, the size of increase is not very big. But very big concern is just red one, uh, which is what the economists call total factor productivity. Uh, and uh, this is indicated by the red zone. And you can just uh, see uh, the total factor productivity growth rate is shrinking, shrinking and becoming almost zero in 2018 and 2019, even before COVID-19. So uh, this uh, very small uh, productivity growth rate is very uh, the largest uh, factors to explain a very uh, low potential growth rate, which is indicated by uh, the black line. So this is what I just I summarized, what I talked. Uh, so labor supply, a number of employee had, uh, employed has been increasing uh, in spite of the aging population. And maybe partly uh, because of increasing female labor force participation. And uh, capital accumulation was very slow and total factor productivity uh, is very slow. There may be two reasons why a total factor productivity uh, growth rate is shrinking. One is investment is very sluggish. Uh, I'm going to show the data later. And for some reason, uh, the investment is not very uh, active in Japan. And second is uh, the, 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 the total factor productivity is a lot thing to do with the technological improvement and in the case of Japan, the so-called digital transformation was very slow before COVID-19. And that may be the another reason why productivity is not increasing. And also uh, because of the very stagnant economy, the interest rate is very low. And there's many uh, so-called zombie company is surviving in Japan and the very slow process of reshuffling of the economy. And so this slow speed of infrastructure adjustment and a very low interest rate it may be the another reason why productivity the growth rate is very slow. This is just what I mentioned. This is the comparison of the female labor participation uh, in Japan, which is blue, and the female labor participation rate uh, of the United States, which is red. And surprisingly, uh, there was a kind of a change of the position uh, around 2015 to 16. Although, uh, quite a large portion of female labor participation in Japan is only the so part-time workers. So there's still, we have a lot more uh, opportunity to just have a, a great labor force, labor force participation of female workers. However, there seems to be some kind of changing pattern and uh, uh, the, this may be contributing to the increasing uh, labor supply in spite of the aging population of Japan. And this is very important data, uh, which is just giving you the idea about the saving investment behavior of corporate sector. Now you can take this kind of data from GDP statistics. So if you look at the GDP, you can have a, this kind of data for household sector, uh, government sectors and corporate sector, which is here and overseas foreign sectors. And so this is the uh, what we call saving investment difference. So saving minus investment of the corporate sector as measured by the share to GDP. And the red one is Japan. And the, you can also see the very similar data for other major countries. Now, important thing is you can just uh, uh, identify the, there was very uh, significant uh, higher position of the corporate sector saving investment balance uh, between the period of 1998 until recent years. 
Now, 1998 is very important year for Japan. This is a year of the financial crisis in Japan. We had the bankruptcy of Yamaha Security in the uh, December of 1997, and there's a very uh, dramatic uh, uh, change of financial market. So in that time period, the company are uh, trying to survive, and they are facing a very big uh, problem of what we call three excesses. One is excess employment, and second, the excess borrowing, and the third is excess uh, the capacity, capital, and so forth. So the company tried to just adjust by uh, to this kind of excess uh, employment and excess borrowing by just uh, reducing the investment and reducing the employment, and also trying to get a more saving in their pocket. So there was a very big jump of the saving behavior of the corporate sector. And unfortunately, because of maybe uh, continuing deflation and con continuing mindset of corporate sector for that kind of uh, economic condition, this uh, situation continues until recently. If you look at the data in the year like 2016 or 2017, the corporate sector's over saving uh, is more than 5% of GDP. Surprisingly, this is almost equivalent to the government uh, budget deficit amount. Uh, you can, uh, I think, I hope you can understand that the government deficit is actually uh, saving investment uh, balance of government sector. This is a minus data. So uh, in some sense, uh, Japanese economy is very stagnant, but very calm. The, government sector's budget deficit can be uh, financed by the private companies uh, over saving. And because of the over saving, that means just very weak demand for investment. So which actually promotes a decreasing interest rate. And because of the very uh, small amount of investment, as I saw uh, before, as I showed before, the uh, capital stock is not increasing very rapidly. So this is actually the, the most serious uh, problem in Japan. So the, this can be summarized by demand side and supply side. So the Japanese economy has a problem uh, both from demand side and supply side. The demand side is very much related to what people call deflationary economy because of the, uh, the stagnant uh, condition uh, because of financial crisis and the over uh, capacity of the companies and also the uh, maybe declining population, uh, we have very uh, weak demand. And that is the reason why the abenomics just emphasize just very strong stimulation. And maybe that kind of strong stimulation was necessary because just provided the, uh, the support for increasing demand. However, uh, as I have mentioned before, we had also the other problem, the supply side problem. Uh, because of the declining population, labor is supply is not increasing very much, and unfortunately, capital is not increasing because there's very uh, weak uh, investment behavior, oh, and and also for some reason, uh, the uh, labor uh, total factor productivity is not increasing, so supply side is not increasing. So, in that kind of situation, just demand stimulation is not enough. We have to do something to do with supply. But it is important just uh, the Abe cabinet recognized this point very well. So in his uh, very famous three alloy of the Abenomics, the first alloy is the monetary stimulation and the second alloy was a fiscal flexibility and third was growth strategy. And growth strategy is a supply side policy. So uh, the point is uh, the government tried to just implement a very strong supply side policy growth strategy but for some reason, it did not work. So we have to just find out the reason why it did not work. And the reason was very simple. Uh, without actions of, of corporate sector, without actions of co corporate sectors on investment and structural reform, uh, it is impossible to raise productivity. So supply side policy uh, by the government has only indirect effects on the uh, the uh, investment behavior. We are kind of very uh, common uh, expression in Japanese. Uh, if you want your horses, 
uh, which just mean companies to drink waters. You can take your horse to the water place, but if the horses are not willing to drink water, it is impossible to just uh, make uh, the horse to drink water. So uh, government can take companies to more uh, uh, investment and uh, structural reform, but unless the company is not willing to do, uh, it is very difficult. So the digital uh, transformation is becoming very important. Now, the, we understand just the digital technology is a very good uh, uh, driving force for changing productivity and for changing the, uh, the government uh, corporate behavior. But unfortunately, GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, and Apple, and these company are overwhelming their head. So, and also you probably know the Chinese uh, is moving very rapidly to just uh, promote the digitalization uh, with the support of the, the 1.3 billion population, which is very big domestic economy. So we uh, understand it's not very easy to just compete with the, uh, the uh, GAFA or even with Chinese uh, companies in the same premium field. And, and the, this also just uh, the, had some kind of concern about Japanese business community that maybe we may become a slave to the GAFA, which means just uh, GAFA, company like GAFA will going to be a very big channel leader and take a quite large value added from the market and Japanese industry may become uh, some kind of a very uh, the, uh, dependent position on that kind of the, the business. So we have to think very care, careful, uh, seriously about what Japan can do, or maybe I should say, what is Japan's comparative advantage in the uh, ICT area? And the one uh, very important concept is so-called the real data versus virtual data. Now virtual data uh, is a data which you can accumulate on the internet uh, spaces like uh, uh, the Google or Facebook. Uh, and this company uh, can collect a quite a large amount of data by looking at just what is going on in internet uh, transaction. And it is not very e easy for Japan uh, to catch up with this kind of uh, the area. So maybe this is the area where the uh, GAFA has a comparative advantage. Why not just uh, depend on their uh, technology However, there is a very big area of what we call real data. There, there's a lot of data is going on uh, with the, uh, the real activity. For example, uh, if you go to the hospital, uh, you can have uh, the, the, the a lot of data on inspection and subscription and so forth. So if you can have a very uh, sophisticated way of just collecting data from real activity of medical services, and that kind of a, uh, interaction between the activity, activity of medication and data on it can be uh, utilized uh, for more uh, activities. Or if you go to the factories, uh, you can see many uh, machines uh, operated to produce say automobile or home appliances. And that kind of uh, activity of the machines actually give a lot of uh, data on the production system or network of the production or logistics of parts and the finished product. And that kind of data uh, can be very uh, useful for real activity. So we have a concept of a data cycle. So this gives you a kind of an image of data cycle. Uh, this is the case of the uh, production of the say, whatever the say, production of automobile. Now, if you look at the section one, you have a lot of collection data. By using sensors, uh, you can just uh, collect the data uh, just from the real activity, uh, what people call international Internet of Things, IoT activity. And that kind of data can be uh, exchanged and transmitted and uh, also accumulated and standardized. And this just provides you so-called big data. And big data uh, maybe can be analyzed by using uh, artificial intelligence and so forth. So this is a kind of uh, the collection 
and uh, the uh, also analyzing the data. And that kind of data can be used for output by using robot and other things. So there seems to be some kind of cycle in the real activity uh, using the data for collection of data and analyzing the data and using the data. And where the not only just uh, virtual activity of data, but also the real activity of production and censorship and adjustment is very important. And this may be providing uh, some kind of uh, advantage for Japanese uh, economy, because without just utilizing the strong part of the real economic activity, it's not very easy for Japan to just survive uh, in the competition in data. And uh, you can think of sev several uh, very typical area where uh, you can just uh, strengthen the data cycle. One is mobility. Uh, automobile uh, is a very important industry to Japan. And of course, automobile has a lot of sensors like camera or the indicator for the fuel or temperature or whatever. And that kind of sensor can be utilized uh, to collect the data uh, around the automobile. And it also, of course, includes the auto autonomous uh, driving car. And uh, so uh, mobility area, uh, anyway, it is changing very rapidly. Uh, can be a very good uh, uh, area where Japan just emphasize the data cycle. Smart manufacturing, you can see a lot, many robots. And also you have a, a lot of uh, need for smart supply chain management. And so you can just utilize this kind of data cycle for the production and also for logistics and supply chain and so forth. And this is another area where the data cycle can be sophisticated. And of course, healthcare. Uh, the, the, we have a lot of uh, data on healthcare and that may be also uh, should be utilized on the real activity of medical services and smart living like smart city or smart housing and so forth. So we have a, some kind of area where there's some kind of synergy between real activity, which has been the strength of Japanese economy and the digital uh, technology and combination. It provides not only a synergy, but also it has a very good uh, driving force for reforming the real sector in Japan. But question was, why this transformation was very slow so far? Well, I can just, uh, just uh, raise up many reasons, uh, but this probably is very familiar uh, with you. And because time is very limited, so I just uh, don't speak a lot. But anyway, corporate sector, medical care, medication, public sector, you can find many reasons that uh, the people are very slow to just take the opportunity of the technology. But the important thing is COVID-19, also it was a very big challenge for not only for Japan, but also for many countries, but it is also a very big opportunity. So the, the COVID-19 may become a so-called wake up call for digital transformation. Uh, I, I don't speak much, but you know very well, uh, work style uh, reform is moving. Uh, Abenomics, Abe, Abe cabinet tried to do very hard to just have a work style reform. But what happened is just the COVID-19 was most effective change to, to change the work style reform and educational style and so, so, so forth. So we should take the, the uh, COVID-19 experience as an opportunity to, to be a wake up call for digital transformation. And also, uh, the, if I just uh, say the government, uh, this, uh, the money, macroeconomic policy by, by Suga cabinet as a Suganomics, what's the difference between Suganomics and Abenomics? And Abenomics was obviously the most successful part is demand stimulation, as I mentioned. But unfortunately, growth strategy was not very effective because the uh, corporate sector did not just uh, start moving. So uh, Suganomics probably have to just continue the demand side stimulation part of economics, uh, especially in the face of COVID-19, we have a very serious problem of the shrinking demand. But uh, at the same time, or on top of it, the supply side uh, policy is very important. And so 
uh, keyword for Sganomics is green and uh, the digital. Uh, uh, I don't have much time to, to, to speak about green, but just uh, about 10 days ago, I had the opportunity to speak to Prime Minister Suga for one hour about the, our strategy for green policy. And he is very positive. And probably if you look at the newspaper articles, uh, there's a very uh, the, uh, strong movement by the Japanese government to shifting from very slow pro process of the green policy to, to more active. And of course, there's going to be a very important summit meeting uh, organized by President Biden uh, the, in the 22nd, I think, of April. And so uh, the, this is another very important area. Uh, also, uh, uh, I don't have much time, but the uh, important thing about green is how we can just uh, shift the investment behavior. This part just gives you the uh, uh, message that we do have a lot of opportunity or capability to make investment. But the problem is whether company are willing to make investment and if the government just uh, uh, speed up the process of the green technology, the company is actually forced to just uh, spend more money on investment. But anyway, so uh, the, I finished my speaking by emphasizing again, we still need a demand stimulation policy for a while, but now just more important is becoming more supply side policy and green and digital is going to be a major uh, part of the supply side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Straight from a uh, leading expert in your conversation with Prime Minister Suga to let us know new and exciting developments for Japan. I think you started off by showing some of the decomposition of the growth potential that was worrisome, but then shifted to help us see areas of promise with Japan having advantages for real data as well as the transformation from data into product. And I'm very glad to hear the policy initiatives for digital and green policies could help on the supply side. So thank you very much for this broad uh, presentation and great insights. I'm sure we have many questions and I'd like to start off. One of our own associates with the program on US Japan relations, Diana Stanescu, is a postdoctoral fellow having just finished her PhD at Princeton. And she would like to ask the first question. Great, thank you, Christina. And thank you for a very informative talk tonight, Professor Ito. So I'm going to ask you a question about the bureaucracy because this is the topic of my dissertation. And I'm curious how someone who is so close to the government in Japan would answer this kind of question. So you know from a lot of research in the past that uh, there has been uh, um, a really high role for the public-private partnership, especially in Japan, between bureaucrats and industry in promoting economic growth. So a lot of research, especially in the 80s and 90s, has highlighted this. And I was wondering, given all the you know, uh, macro you know, economic policy issues that you have highlighted tonight, what are some of the ways in which this relationship between bureaucracy and industry you think has changed in the past years in a way that has been perhaps detrimental to economic growth? And relatedly, since bureaucratic reforms or solutions um, are often proposed in Japan, including by Prime Minister Suga with the digital agency. Which ones do you think have been or have the potential to be most effective to address some of the issues on the supply side that you have highlighted tonight? Well, uh, it's a, a very large good question. question, but it's also a very difficult question. But you probably know very well about the changing uh, pattern of bureaucracy in the last 20 years. In the, the past, the each ministry has a very uh, strong power to their area. And there's a very strong compa com compartment of, of the division among the ministries. But increasingly, the cabinet office uh, becoming more uh, influence on the, the problem. And the uh, important thing is the, there was is increasing competition to each policy among the cabinet, uh, among the ministries. And cabinet tried to just organize uh, or coordinate the behavior. So take the case, typical case is green policies, where traditionally probably Minister of International Trade and Economy, because it has a, the energy agency has a more strong influence. And also they have very close relation with the, the Kedanden, the business sectors. But now uh, the, the uh, 
appointment of Mr. Koizumi, who is a very uh, the powerful uh, position as a minister of the Env Environment Ministry, there seems to be some kind of a coordination and a competition among the, uh, uh, the, the two industries, uh, two ministries. And then the, because the green strategy is so important, the cabinet, especially prime minister, should not try to just take some kind of a position. So there seems to be a changing politics and the decision making process in bureaucracy. And uh, the, so leadership of the prime minister is very important. And similar thing can be maybe said in the case of other cabinet where the, the prime minister is becoming uh, the kind of frontliner for the reform. Now, and also it is very important if you look at just the, the policy, uh, the private sector, uh, the behavior is very important and private sector is not one entity. There are many different uh, behavior pattern and viewpoint on the issue. Uh, most easy uh, case is green strategies. If you look, you talk to the uh, Kedanden uh, business uh, confederation people say five years ago, 10 years ago, there's kind of a, just one voice. They are very careful about the process of the green technology and they are very careful of the process of reform from the traditional production system to the more uh, aggressive behavior, behavior on global warming. But uh, the, that kind of a position is changing because there's a, the other type of voice is coming from business sectors. So the behavior of the business sector and the relation between business community and the bureaucrat is changing gradually. And uh, whether the, this kind of policy is successful or not, it just uh, depends on whether the, the government, especially the prime minister, can take advantage of this kind of changing behavior. I, I don't know whether I ans ask, answer your question or not. If not, please just ask um, additional questions. I have to follow up to ask if the leadership of the prime minister's office is stronger, but there's more diversity in the private sector voices. How can, what are the tools the prime minister can use to encourage more investment by the private sector? I mean, prime minister Abe was urging companies to raise wages to little effect, what are the other tools he could use? Well, I think uh, what I just mentioned uh, about digitalization is the government has a very limited capability of affecting the investment behavior of by corporate sectors. So we need the more market uh, condition, which just uh, push uh, or give pressure uh, to the companies. And that's the reason why COVID-19 was a very big important event for changing behavior of the company. But at the same time, for some area, maybe the government uh, can have more uh, influence on the investment behavior of the company. And green is a typical area. Now we often, speak uh, uh, the, when we want to just promote the uh, green uh, technology and the more uh, behavior for uh, moving against the global warming, uh, we have to think the supply side and demand side again. Supply side, by supply side, I mean just corporate sector try to just uh, uh, do investment effort to just achieve the target. That was the traditional Japanese approach. So asking the uh, industries to set the target and try to just achieve the target. But that is not enough. So we need some kind of pressure from demand, demand side. And the, now we are starting to recognize more uh, that the demand side is becoming a very important uh, key person. Uh, one typical demand side uh, is the government. If government said the more explicit and more difficult target, 
And then that's just become a very big pressure uh, to the uh, corporate sector. And of course, there's other uh, very important demand side uh, pressure. One is just uh, like a SDG investment. So investment market is becoming a pressure for the companies. And also, I don't know if we are going to have a more higher uh, carbon tax, for example. And that kind of uh, pricing uh, the, uh, policy can be an uh, additional uh, the target. So what I want to say is when you have a very big uh, policy target, such as just uh, stopping the global warming, and the government can have a very effective uh, demand side pressure to the behavior of the company, which actually may promote the investment. So depending on the problem, I mean, the, for, for this particular moment, maybe uh, the COVID-19, uh, this is not just uh, action by the government, that's COVID-19 is uh, becoming a very important uh, uh, changing uh, condition for investment behavior for companies and uh, green policy, which is very uh, important uh, uh, national target uh, is actually becoming a very important uh, starting point for giving pressure for making more investment by uh, government. Okay, thank you. We'll hope that the Japanese government can use these tools and the private sector response. Let's see, we have a question from Alicia Kochekova. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, thank you. Dear moderator, dear colleagues of the participants of the US-Japan seminar on Japan's growth strategy in the 2020s, demand and supply side dimensions, dear guests and invitees, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this event. My name is Alicia Vyacheslavovna Kachitkova. I have a scientific degree of the Candidate of Sciences in Economics from the St. Petersburg State University of Economics and Finance, Russian Federation. I thank Professor Tu for the presentation and I want to ask my core questions, please. Please only ask what? one question. I'm sorry, there's others with questions waiting as well. So just one question, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Which imprescriptible components, in your opinion, should mechanism for regulating the effectiveness of the innovative activities at the Japan's industrial enterprises level include building on quantitative aggregates for intensification of innovative capacity of global economy. Thank you. Uh, I am sorry, could, could you just repeat your question again? Yes, of course. Which imprescriptible components should mechanism for regulating the effectiveness of the innovative activities at the Japan's industrial enterprises level include building on quantitative aggregates for intensification of the innovative capacity of global economy. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether I, I understand your question, but uh, uh, I, I certainly just uh, uh, think global uh competitiveness and global uh the uh, environment is very important uh factors affecting the innovative behavior of the japanese industry and so uh the reason for example why i just uh, emphasize the difference between the uh, virtual data and real data for the area of digitalization is we always have to think about the comparative advantage concept which means we have to depend on the capability of the technology abroad always, but at the same time, we have to thinking about what we can do uh, as a, the comparative advantage uh, position of our economy. So global trend is always very important. Probably uh, 40 years or 50 years ago, when the, we are not so much uh, open the period, uh, the quantitative, quantitative uh, target and the more intervention of the government uh, was in, more important 
maybe 40 years or 50 years ago. But nowadays, it is almost impossible uh, to just uh, think anything uh, about the innovation without thinking about the international environment. So I think global uh, pressure, global competition, and global opportunity is probably the most important uh, factor for Japanese innovative activities. I'm not sure whether I just answered your question, but... Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And next we have a question from Shinju Fujihira. Oh, thanks, Christina. Um, I was expecting to be called, but thank you for calling me. I put this my question in the chat. Um, so I recall Dale Jorgensen's uh, study. Um, oh, uh, oh, Hugh. Dale Jorgensen's study of uh, TFB gap between US and Japan. And I recall that the main sectors that account for it were wholesale and the retail and also other services, agriculture um, and, and construction. And so my question was, because there are these concentrated sectors which are known historically to be uh, less pro uh, uh, pro low, low level productivity, just how digitalization and the green agenda that you put forward uh, could help these sectors. Thank you. Well, I think uh, I, it's a very good question, but I didn't just speak much about the, uh, the other aspect of the productivity. Uh, when you're thinking about just increasing productivity of the economy, you can probably uh, think about three, two different things. One is, uh, of course, technological uh, development and just introduce a new type of the business model. It just can promote just increasing productivity. And this digital, digitalization uh, is going to be very effective. But the other very important thing about increasing productivity, if you look at the industries such as wholesale or retail sectors, you can find some companies or some sectors which is very highly productive. If I took the, take one typical case like a convenience stores or the company like uh, the apparel store like Uniqlo, it's very highly product, pro productive. But at the same time, you can find many, many companies and many, many area where productivity is very low. So if you have a kind of shifting of the resources from, lay pro from very low productive companies to high productive companies, then you can have a very high increase in productivity. And that kind of a reshuffling inside of the sectors is probably more important. And unfortunately, because of the very sluggish economy and very low interest rate, and also the kind of a behavior where the government tried to just to give a support for uh, you know, so-called zombie companies uh, providing just process of the reshuffling of the industry very slow. And so that is maybe another area which I actually did not speak much. <laughs> but thank you for your question. Yeah. Thank you. I see we're uh, joined by Professor Hugh Patrick of Columbia. Did you want to ask a question or make a comment? Yes, I wanted to ask a question. Um, uh, I wanted to get your views on what, what do you worry most about for Japan? It's very simple. What do you worry most about? <laughs> your, your question is, is also very difficult. <laughs> well, uh, I think, uh, Probably uh, the financial market and the uh, fiscal uh, market of actually fiscal position is a big worry for, for me because the in the last 30 years, uh, because of the very uh, sluggish Japanese economy, we had very low interest rate and low growth rate and low inflation rate which actually provided us some kind of stability. It's very sluggish, but it's very stable. So if the economy is shifting from the, uh, this kind of a low interest, low growth, low inflation to more active uh, state, maybe not in, in the case of Japan, but probably United States is much quicker to recover, then uh, I'm not sure whether we can just uh, sustain the present position. Uh, 
probably uh, the stock price is very sensitive to, to the increasing interest rate. And uh, also, we are not so sure whether the government can su sustain the large amount of government debt for many periods. So there must be some kind of adjust mechanism. So that is uh, the, my uh, biggest concern uh, so far. And the, the other, uh, this is not a very, uh, uh, I'm not thinking very carefully at this moment, but uh, uh, trade uh, area, especially the US-China uh, uh, relation is going to have a very uh, big influence on Japanese position. And, uh, and the, so this is another, uh, not economic and also geopolitical side of the uh, Asian Pacific area is another very big uh, factors for affecting our, not our economy and our society. So Hugh, do you think you can come to Japan this year? Yeah, I want to, yes, very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Thank you for your very difficult question. Thank you, thank you. Since I study trade policy, I would like to ask you more on the trade dimension. As you yes. note, the worry for many of us is uncertainty with the possibility of decoupling efforts pushed by the United States, not only for its own companies to change their trade pattern with China, but more aggressively to push other countries to secondary sanctions to change their investment strategies with China. Yeah. In light of that, I wonder, has the deepening of Japan's reliance on global value chains, regional production networks, been a net positive for total factor productivity growth in Japan? And would a shift away from reliance on China be harmful to Japan's economy? Well, I think uh, supply side, supply chain uh, is becoming a very important uh, the thing for Japanese companies. So they are watching very carefully about the uh, US-China decoupling uh, situation. Uh, so they probably can adjust uh, to the changing uh, environment of that thing if they, have, they are given time to adjust. But if there's going to be very dramatic, a very sh sudden change <laughs> about the uh, US-China uh, debate on certain area like the integrated circuit or maybe automobile or whatever it is, then the Japanese company has some kind of trouble of adjusting. But probably uh, Japanese industry is now well prepared to the changing environment uh, of the global supply chain. So uh, they try to just be less dependent on Chinese economy uh, on that matter. So uh, this is a matter of adjustment. But more worrisome uh, or more maybe uh, important thing is the global uh, economic condition itself is not change, is changing a lot. Uh, in the last five years, uh, when I just participate in the, the international conference on, in any countries, the people who, who is just an uh, expert on say WTO or international system always say the following question, is it possible for United States and China to uh, coexist in the present WTO system? And the implicit answer is not <laughs> uh, because the uh, the, the many different type of behavior. So the multilateral regime is not working very well uh, for promoting uh, the uh, trade and investment. So uh, probably, uh, of course, uh, to uh, the reconstruct the global multilateral system is important, but it's not very easy. So more regional, such as TPP, or the Japan EU uh, type of uh, 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 the negotiation <coughs> is becoming more important. And so uh, I, I just, uh, it's very interesting. What is the Americans uh, position uh, to this kind of regional uh, 
uh, trade agreement, uh, maybe not in the very immediate, uh, very soon, but uh, uh, gradually the, that position becoming more and more important. I'm very much interested in what is going on uh, about the American uh, position about the regional uh, trade relations. We're very fortunate to have Gwen Fukushima joining us. Did you have oh. anything to answer Professor Ito's question on the American direction? Uh, I would just say, can you hear me? Yes, yes, thank That's you. Good. So I would just good say, to you. <laughs> good to see you, Ito Sensei, yeah. that uh, because the Biden administration's focus on uh, foreign policy uh, for a middle class, a foreign policy that will benefit the American middle class. I think that international trade agreements will not be a high priority. Yeah. I, I think it's possible if the US economy recovers, if there's more confidence in the US and there's a perception that the US really is losing out by not being engaged in the um, uh, economic architecture of Asia, uh, beyond just the quad, uh, then I think there is a possibility over the next, say, two to three years for some momentum to develop. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's going to take some time. I yeah. think the, the, the view is that the political capital necessary in order to reach an agreement, get it through the Congress, get the consensus and, and support of the American middle class, it, it's, 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 uh, it's a very high political uh, uh, costs involved and the benefits in terms of the amount of benefits and the immediacy of the benefits don't justify doing it now. But I'm hopeful that in the longer term that there will be more of an openness and receptiveness, but unfortunately not right now. But I look forward to talking with you more about this when we next meet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, actually, in the, among the, uh, the mainstream economists, uh, we are now having a more discussion about pain, pain from trade rather than gain from trade. Right. Yeah. Well, I think some you know, of that is we need better um, political discussion about the, how to document the wins from trade so that they are fully appreciated. It's always the problem that the, the losses are sharply felt and the gains are not as sharply felt. And for well, I think we need, we need two things. One is, as you say, we need to document and show the gains, but we also need to have a better safety net so that those yeah. people who are displaced will be able to get retraining and to get jobs, hopefully better jobs. Otherwise, there's gonna be a continued resistance and opposition especially yeah. by labor unions. That's right. So the US has to do a much better job in the safety net, which Japan and Europe are much better in doing, as you well know. I was uh, involved a lot about trade uh, liberalization for many years. And uh, it, it was very difficult because of the uh, agricultural sector was very yes. strongly interesting. But for some reason in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, the, there's very, visible changing uh, behavior of these people, maybe because they are uh, becoming smaller and smaller, but at the same time, there seem to be a more understanding about the importance of the globalization. Right. Well, I think it takes political leadership, but also I think there are a lot of subsidies in Japan that help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, that's true. Yes, they, the slow actually, liberalization that is generously compensated is a nice recipe for helping to ease the backlash. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I could continue talking even longer, but we are at the appointed time and it's late at night for those of us on the East Coast. But I really, really appreciate uh, Professor Ito for sharing your experience and ideas with us. And I'm also very glad we had a wide uh, audience so we could get some excellent questions to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.